When Angelo Lucchese reached out to his friend Hap Motlo for a favor, he wasn't thinking about making history or being the first at anything. He was merely a guy needing a job. Nearly 70 years later, Lucchese's name lives on as one of the most important figures in the history of the Jack Daniels distillery, with the man behind it doing the simplest thing he could muster, being himself. On this episode, we talk with Jack Daniels historian Nelson Eddy about the far from predestined path Angelo took to make it in the whiskey world, about how the most preeminent entertainer of his day called Angelo a friend, and about how sampling the wares doesn't have to be a prerequisite when it comes to selling what's in and around the barrel. Welcome back to Around the Barrel, the official podcast from the makers of Jack Daniels. I'm your host, Lucas Hendrickson. Hi, my name is Nelson Eddy, and I'm the Jack Daniels historian, and I've had the privilege of working with Jack Daniels for 35 years, starting this year. Nelson Eddy, welcome back to Around the Barrel. It feels like we just did this a few months ago, but that's all right. I again, I can I can take every opportunity I can to pick your brain about the the history of this particular brand and all the people associated with it. So we appreciate you spending a little time with us again today. Um, Speaking of people and names and figures that are, you know, seminal to the history of this brand, uh, we're going to talk to a little bit today and unpack the history of one Angelo Lucchese. Uh, kind of the, the elevator pitch on him, the simplest way to put it, first salesperson ever hired for the distillery, but it certainly has a, uh, a wild and colorful history that goes along with that. Tell us a little bit about who Angelo Lucchese was. Sure, and I'm privileged to do this, having spent time with Angelo and, and traveled with him to the West Coast where you know celebrities treat him like the Pope has arrived. <laughs> um, we'll talk more about that in a minute, but uh, yeah, you know, Angelo Lucchese, he was one of 13 children. His parents had immigrated from Italy. Mm-hmm. Uh, his father will be a f- very successful grocer. Uh, he'll own several houses uh, in South Memphis. Okay. So Angelo's growing up in South Memphis in a little Italian community. Um, and yeah, the two things that people talk about the most is he was the first, very first salesman for Jack Daniels. And we'll get into how that happened. <laughs> and then the other thing everyone brings up is he was Frank Sinatra's uh, link or tie to Jack Daniels. Right. And we can we can talk about that some. But he was so much more. Sure. Unpack a little bit what the whiskey selling world was like, you know, when he was brought into the company. It wasn't the situation where you had a specialty beverage shop on every corner. You know, sometimes you didn't even have one in the, in the, in the, in the county, you know, where you lived in or even relatively near you. What were the things that, um, that brought him to the distillery? Um, and, and what kind of, kind of market forces did he uh, have to deal with in those earliest days as a salesperson directly for Jack Daniels? Wow. I mean, you asked two things. How did he come to the distillery? <laughs> well, yeah. And th- that could fill up a half an hour. I'll try sure. to keep that part short, and then we'll get to the part, what did the landscape look like in 1953 when he joins? Mm-hmm. So, you know, Angelo's born in 1920. Okay. And um, he, interestingly enough, he, um, he gets through high school at St. Bernard's and then decides to go to a monastery in Coleman, Alabama, where he's gonna be a Benedictine monk. Okay. He spends two years there, and then, uh, yeah, this is this guy's just <laughs> incredibly interesting. He spends two years there, and he, they're getting ready to take what they call the simple vows, and he, re- he really doesn't think he could do it. And rather than not keep his vows, because that's the kind of guy uh, Angelo always was, he decides, I'm just going to have to leave. So he leaves, and he ends up being a clerk at a retail establishment called Circle Inn there in in um, Memphis. And then uh, a gentleman comes by and wants talks him in. He's about 24 years old at this time. Talks him into being a salesperson for Southern Host, which is a liqueur that's very much like Southern Comfort. Okay. And so Angelo says, okay, give it a try. So he goes to the warehouse. One day he's at the warehouse. This gentleman comes walking through, uh, 
and he says, you know, I'm D.E. Motlow. I'm president of Jack Daniels. Okay. And Angelo is kind of going, so what? <laughs> What's Jack Daniels? Right. Yeah. Nobody, you know, right. really not heard of it. He wasn't familiar with it, and no one really knew, um, you know, Hap Motlow at this point. So he thinks nothing of it. So about two weeks later, Angelo is taking his first business trip as a young man for his company. Comes to Nashville to meet with Lipman Brothers. Mm-hmm. And um, he stays at the Andrew Jackson Hotel, okay. unknowing that this is the permanent residence of Hap Motlow. Sure. Where Hap lives right. is at the hotel there in downtown Nashville. So he gets there, and guess what? They don't, they, he checks in, but they don't have a room for him. Mm. And he'd already set up to have a room. He made reservations. They don't have a room. They said, why don't you sleep on the couch? And he's kind of frustrated. <laughs> he's a young guy. His, his first kind of sales job here. And he's got a, going to be forced to sleep on the couch. He doesn't think much of it. But so he just gets on the couch. They send him a cover. They send him, as, as he talks about, a ham sandwich and a Coke. <laughs> and they tell him they'll get him a room at 6 in the morning. Right. Well, about 11.30 p.m. that same day or that night, in comes walking this gentleman, and he kind of throws up a hand, and Angelo doesn't know who it is, but he's polite and waves back. And the gentleman goes to the front desk, and he asks the clerk, does, does that gentleman have one arm? <laughs> and the guy says, yes, he does. He says, I met a one-armed gentleman somewhere. Send the kid up to my room with a cot, and he can stay with me. And as Angelo likes to put it, he never got rid of me. <laughs> Hap and Angelo were great friends. Hap Motlow now is the son of Lem Motlow. Right. After Lem passes away in 47, the four Motlow brothers will run the distillery, and Hap is the president. And um, they, they spent all kinds of time together. Because at the time that they meet, Angelo isn't married yet, and Hap will be you know, a confirmed bachelor for life. But they meet up and they start traveling together. They make fabulous trips across country on a train to San Francisco. Uh, at the time, they're making uh, Jack Daniels and Lem Motlow brandy. Okay. And so they go together uh, to find apples uh, for the brandy. Oh, okay. And they're traveling together. So they're great friends. That's the one thing about Angelo. He was never really a salesperson. He just knew how to make friends. Right. And this was the first friendship uh, that, that did him quite well. So they make friends. It's about 10 years later. Most people think, you know, he got hired on his job. He was friends with the Motlows for 10 years. He calls up Hap. He's got a couple questions. And he asks Hap, this is 1953. He says, you know, can I get some tickets to the Vanderbilt, Alabama game? Mm. It's going to be played in Nashville that year. And, and Hap says, yeah, anything else you need? I'll give you two tickets, one for you and your wife. Anything else you need? And he said, how about a job? <laughs> and there's a lull, as Angelo describes it. Right. And he goes, are you there? And he says, we're not ready to be hiring anybody. He said, well, let me be the first. I can be your f- very first salesperson. Right. And so Hap doesn't say anything else. But after that game, the that after that game, they kind of see each other after the game, and Hap says, "Come by on Tuesday. Come back here in, to Nashville on Tuesday. We're going to make you Jack Daniels' very first salesperson." So at that time, there was no marketing department. Right. There was no sales department. The, if you can imagine this, the Motlow brothers kind of did it all. Yeah. And uh, and it wasn't really much out of Tennessee. I was going to ask what was was the footprint of of distribution at that point. I mean, you know, again, Angelo hadn't heard of it and lived in the you know the far western corner of the state, uh, and 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 Lynchburg being in the you know south central por- portion of the of the state, and yet that name at that point didn't mean anything to him. No. So the 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 footprint uh, uh, you know uh, uh, around which Jack Daniels was existing at that point was not very wide. Well, and and you know coming after World War II and we talked that about that in an earlier mm-hmm. episode, coming after World War II, distribution was beginning to pick up. Right. Because the GIs come back from World War II and they're asking for Jack Daniels all across the country, but they can't get it right. or they can only get a bottle and not a case. So Distribution may have been kind of wide, but, but it was availability, yeah. it was spotty for sure. Yeah. And a lot of people. So in 53, when Angelo joins, it's about 100,000, maybe north of 100,000. Three years later, 
it'll be about 200,000 cases mm -hmm. when Brown Foreman purchase it. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a totally different landscape. His territories were Memphis, Chattanooga, and Nashville. Okay. And, uh, you know, at that time in the 50s, Nashville still not, doesn't have liquor by the mm -hmm. drink. So there's not a whole lot of action in this territory. <laughs> and he'll later to go up to Chicago, and there's some interesting stories of what happens when he goes to Chicago. But, but that's kind of the footprint. It's not a big deal. He needed a job because the company uh, that was you know, distributing Southern Host was merging with another company, and he didn't see his name in the merger. Mm, right. So he didn't even know he was going to stay there. He's just hopping onto a job, and his friend helped him out. But he remained there 60 years. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Well, and again, you, you talk about uh, uh, him being recognized as, or he was in the back of Motlow's head as, as, I met this this kid with one arm. What was the situation of, of Angelo's uh, uh, single armedness, if you, for lack of a, of a better term? <laughs> yeah. You, know, you wonder how much him only having one arm uh, contributed to his character. Mm -hmm. he was, uh, you know, when tragedy happens to you some people just you know it becomes woe is me sure angelo it was just he, he never had a handicap right uh and in fact he used it to his advantage in that <laughs> instance sure he was, he was completely memorable yeah um so his father as i said had a grocery and of course they had a meat department uh angelo's under five years old when this happens oh my uh the kids were forbidden to be in the store when they were grinding sausage, but mm -hmm. Angelo, under five, just goes poking around, ends up with his arm caught in a mm -hmm. meat grinder. Mm -hmm. The family saves his life. They didn't even know it at the time because they not only took him in, they took the grinder in with him. And okay. that really sure. you know, cut off the flow of blood right. and kept him from bleeding to death. But, you know, um, like I said, he was always such a... He, the way he made friends is he was so positive around you. You just like to have the guy around. Right. And he was so gracious and kind. Um, and, you know, the, all of those things, he never met anyone in his life who didn't ultimately become a friend. Sure. Um, and all of those characteristics, but also had a, a lot of stick to a lot of loyalty, certainly to the brand and to the people that, that he was working with. Uh, what were the other kind of characteristics that... Um, made him decide to stay with with Jack for his whole life and and watch that growth as it uh, as that name and that brand and that whiskey became world famous. Well, you know, like I said, um, he he worked with him for 60 years mm -hmm. and I probably worked with him. He died in um, uh, 2013. So I worked with him for over 20 of those years. Mm -hmm. And whenever I watched him with with uh, young people, he would, he would begin by saying, look, this isn't a brand to me. Mm -hmm. I knew the people that made this. Right. I knew the company. Uh, the Motlows were really good friends of mine. And he, he felt like it was his duty. And I will tell you, the Motlows were very good to Angelo. Mm -hmm. um, Angelo likes to say he had a bad habit of gulping his whiskey instead of sipping it mm -hmm. and that habit got him into trouble uh very early on in his career angelo comes to the motlows and says look i cannot stop drinking mm. and so they say angelo we're going to take care of your family we're going to get you into a facility to take care of this and when he got out he never had a, a drink again mm. he knows a lot of whiskey and would talk about jack daniels every day of his life going forward from that point but he didn't have a drop of whiskey. Um, and it, it was just interesting to me, two things, that the Motlows would stick by him. Mm -hmm. And at an early point in the uh, history of the liquor business, you could get by selling something that you just never had a drink. <laughs> right. You know, that's pretty incredible. Yeah. And so he was extremely loyal, um, and the Motlows were, were loyal to him. And it's that loyalty, too, that there are still stories to this day that he will allude to, uh, but he won't tell because he knew Frank Sinatra gave him the story in trust. Right. And from one of Frank's wife, I believe it was Barbara Sinatra, said the reason he tells you those stories, Angelo, is he loves you and he trusts you. Yeah. He had over his uh, relationship with uh, Frank, he had 20 letters he'd received from mm -hmm. Frank on the road. 
And he got a letter shortly after Frank's uh, mother uh, suddenly died in a plane accident. And to this day, he kept that letter all to himself. Nobody ever, el- mm. nobody else ever saw it. Right. You 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 led me into my next uh, you know uh, my next conversation piece of uh, he was he was the the conduit the liaison whatever you want to call it. Uh, between Sinatra and the distillery, how did they meet? How did they come across each other? Uh, and you know, what were the other things that kind of led to them being as close as they were, uh, just as people, as opposed to here's somebody that can get me with the whiskey that I love. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, people always said, "Well, Angelo turned uh, Frank Sinatra into Jack Daniels," and Angelo would say, "I didn't get him <laughs> on it. I just kept him on it." And by that he meant, you know, he made sure wherever Frank Sinatra traveled, there were always five to ten cases of Jack, which was unheard of in that sure. day, waiting for him. Um, and this is the way it happened. And it, again, you know, you go, wow, he was a, he was destined to become a monk, and he ends up a whiskey <laughs> salesman. How does that work? Well, in Angelo's case, it worked to his advantage. Almost every day of the man's life, he would go to mass in the morning before mm-hmm. going to work. And so one of the people that would take him to mask, uh, mass in um, Nashville was Mike Filio. Okay. And Mike Filio is a nephew of Jilly Rizzo. Okay. And Jilly is Frank Sinatra's right-hand man. Okay. So, and, and Mike Filio was also working at Capitol Rec- Records at the time. So he's taken Angelo to mass, and he says, you know, my uncle called me last night, and... Frank's in a tizzy. He's at the Coca Cabana. He can't find any Jack Daniels anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so I'm reaching out to you as one good Italian to another. (laughs) uh, Can you help me? And so Angelo's going, What can I do? So uh, the next day, when he's at work, he goes in to to see uh, Hap Motlow. He says, Mm -hmm. Hap, you know, uh, Frank Sinatra really likes our whiskey and, and he can't find any. And, and Hat Milo goes, talk to Winton Smith, who was the president of Jack Daniels at this time. He goes, talk to Winton Smith. Um, you know, he likes Sinatra. Maybe he can figure it out. <laughs> so Angelo goes to Winton Smith. Winton Smith says, just wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'll be right back. He comes back and he says, it's taken care of. That's the only answer Angelo gets. So he goes home, not sure what in the world has happened. And this is 1967. Okay. Uh, and the brand has already benefited big time because Sinatra is getting up on stage sure. going, Jack Daniels, nectar of the gods, you know, best booze in the world. So uh, two weeks later, he's at home in Memphis with his wife, and the phone rings. And he picks up the phone, and there's a voice on the other end that says, Paisano, <laughs> I love you. You're my friend for life. And Angelo just goes, Mr. Sinatra. Sinatra goes, how do you know it's me? And he, Angelo just, he says he thought it was a silly answer, but it's actually a pretty good one. He goes, no one sounds like you, <laughs> but you. And so from that time forward, um, they had a constant correspondence. Um, they would meet together once or two times a year. Uh, at one point, you know, uh, Sinatra will, will bring uh, to Las Vegas, Angelo and his wife backstage at a concert. And whenever he saw him, you know, those one or two times a year, Sinatra, would it would be a closed-door thing. Right. It would just be the two of them in a dressing room uh, before the concert, and they would just talk. Sure. And again, a lot of uh, the contents of those, it was, and Angelo says, it was personal in nature, and, and so it's, it's better left unsaid. Yeah. Do you have any sort of, um, aside from the, you know, the personal nature of that, did he have a, a, you know, a visible business relationship? Did he have like official duties, if you will, uh, as far as maintaining that relationship or was it just that they were comfortable with each other and, and both loved the same, the same whiskey and, and just built that friendship that way. Was there an official or or any unofficial, you know, direct link between the two in relation to the distillery? This is pretty interesting. You know, in this day and age, if a celebrity gets on board with a brand because they like it, not because they're paid, right? which I don't hear much of that. (laughs) Not so much. But if they do, well, the top executives are all over. Right. Winton Smith, to his credit, and one of the reasons Jack Daniels has always been extremely genuine, 
as a brand. It, it is what it says it is. And it goes back to people like Winton Smith, who thought, you know, who liked Sinatra. Mm-hmm. That's the reason he got the whiskey. Sure. But he would never stand in the way of that relationship. It was always the relationship, not with the president of the company, not right. with the head of marketing, with a salesperson and Frank. Yeah. In fact, there was at one point in this, there was a vice president, um, and this vice president of the company really wanted to get in with Sinatra. So he showed up at a concert and was backstage with Angelo and, and Sinatra and kind of inserts himself. And Frank just kind of goes, who's this guy? I don't know him. <laughs> and he, soon after that, we don't know exactly why he was let go, but he was let go. Mm. I mean, maintaining that relationship was really important to the brand, and it was in Angelo's hands. Nowadays, would we leave that in the hands of a salesperson? But it was a genuine friendship. Or even and, just one person. It'd be a oh, whole yeah. team of people that, oh. uh, you know, uh, kind of micromanaging that relationship. So that was, uh, you know, an interesting day and age in which, you know, two guys get in a room, you, you figure out what uh, what needs to be done or just have a conversation and and, and let that uh, let that relationship, li- you know, live as it does. Well, and it was no small trick keeping uh, Frank Sinatra and Jack Daniels. <laughs> well, yeah, there's that. You had to have it wherever he was in the country and a distributor might not be near we didn't have international distribution and he was flying around the world right so when he would take off it was always there were cases of jack daniels he loaded in the plane and so that was to the brand's benefit too you have the prince of monaco you know uh (laughs) entertaining at home frank sinatra and lo and behold he ends up a jack a friend of jack daniels that's no coincidence it's because you know frank had that kind of influence over a lot of people yeah um what were the other kind of uh, relationships and, uh, you know, goals and, and expectations that Angelo had as, as as a salesperson in in the midst of the growth of this kind of brand? He was he was not just not just uh, Frank's guy, but uh, was involved in a lot of other kind of things with the distillery as well. Well, yeah, and 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 he would laugh. I think uh, towards the end of his life, we might have been seventeen million cases. He th- he <laughs> saw it from. 100,000 yeah. cases to about, you know, 16, 17 million at the time he passes away. But he talks about those early days and he says, boy, things changed. Yeah. Uh, for example, uh, whenever you made a deal, you're expected to, you know, have a, a drink of whiskey. Mm-hmm. And so he talks about going to Chicago. He's going to Chicago for the first time. And, you know, Hap comes to him and goes, we need to sell some whiskey to italian folks in chicago Mm -hmm. uh and so you're the man and angelo's going you think just because i'm italian i know every (laughs) italian he's going well i I didn't but his brother johnny knows some lawyers in chicago okay so uh he goes up to chicago meets with the lawyer the lawyer's going to drive him around to these different you know distributor houses and uh, he's going the lawyer's going to take the orders so they get to the first one, and the lawyer looks at him before he gets out of the car and says, this is mafiosa. <laughs> and Angelo goes, "And <laughs> should I be worried? And he goes, no, you, you just go in. Well, Angelo does get worried because he goes in, the guy's packing a gun, and he's all upset. And Angelo's going, you know, how can I help you? And the guy's going, I haven't seen anybody from your brand for three years. Mm. Angelo goes, and that's why I'm here to help <laughs> And the guy takes his gun out of his uh, coat pocket, puts it in a drawer, shuts the drawer, sits down with Angelo and says, let's have a drink to seal our friendship. And Angelo says, so he pulls a bottle of old granddad because they'd sold all the Jack Daniels at this point. Right. Pulls out some old granddad, pours it, and they have a drink. So Angelo says, "We, we saw 11 places that day. Eight of them were mafiosa. And I had a drink at every one of them. Oh, my. And he says, by the end of that day. But that was just what was expected in that day. Yeah. It's not the kind of uh, way we do business today. Right. By any stretch. And later, Angelo wouldn't be either. Um, but that, that kind of illustrates what it was like. So he saw it take off. And the prime reason, you know, we've talked about this before, uh, and people can listen to earlier podcasts mm-hmm. about it, but... Uh, in the 50s, you know, you have the soldiers coming back after World War II. You have Frank Sinatra. If you had to put it on one guy that made this brand, like, 
In the 60s, sales went up 100% in Mm -hmm. a single year, which you can't catch up to that. In fact, they didn't catch up to that kind of demand that they were getting until like 1979. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and and Sinatra is key to all that, and Angelo is key to Sinatra. So yeah, he watches a lot of things happen. Mm -hmm. He watches the city of Nashville open up and start serving liquor by the drink in the 60s. so, yeah, he, he's a witness to all that. But, um, and, and it wasn't just Frank Sinatra. Frank would introduce uh, Angelo to a world of celebrities. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sammy Davis Jr. was a big uh, friend of, of, of Jack's. And so he would meet uh, Frank. He'd meet all the members of the Rat Pack, right. of course. And then people like Dinah Shore, he'd meet, he'd meet, oh, I don't know, Peter Lawford, uh, Joe Montagna. Dinah Shore, I said that one, Robert Stack, Tony Bennett, uh, Danny Thomas. Mm. And, and so he, the other thing mm. Angelo was big in, and, and this goes back to his religious roots, mm-hmm. is charity. Right. So St. Jude has received untold money from Angelo Lucchese, uh, and because of the friendship with Danny Thomas. Yeah. You know, that was, that was key. And the other charity that has received a lot of Angelo's time and attention over the years was Barbara Sinatra's charity. Okay. Um, and that was the um, Sinatra Children's Center. Mm-hmm. It was a hospital for children that had been abused. Uh, Frank and Barbara had a great heart for that. It was really Barbara's charity. And, you know, Angelo was part of that year after year. There was a Sinatra golf tournament, and, um, you know, Jack Daniels would help sponsor that, mm-hmm. and all of that's because of Angelo Lucchese and his, his heart, as well as his ability to make friends. Yeah. Um, it, it's a it's such a great story of, you know, how he got to, you know, be involved in the in the growth of this brand over the years and get to see it flourish and, and make these friendships that you can only kind of dream of, uh, you know, an Italian kid coming from Memphis. You know, he he got to enjoy that part of his legacy as he was living it. Oh, well, yeah. what's the kind of his, um, you know, how would how did the, kind of the end of his life play out, and and you know, what is his ongoing legacy with the brand today? Well, you said he has really has several legacies. I think it was Paul Varga who said, you know, a lot of our characteristics as a brand and as a company and how we treat people have been built from people like Angelo Lucchese. Mm-hmm. And in fact, there's a, an annual award that's, that's given out in Angelo's name uh, among the sales folks uh, at Brown Foreman, and it's named after Angelo. And it, it, um, it's given to salesmen who embody the excellence and the, the spirit and the heart of, of Angelo Lucchese. And so that's one way the legacy lives on. Uh, when Brown Foreman uh, started a program for employees that was about responsible drinking mm-hmm. and really emphasized that, and that you know you didn't really have to drink to be an employee, who's, who's the person they brought in <laughs> to lend credibility, sure. to talk to the employees? Angelo was the first speaker, and they said he hit it out of the park. Yeah. Um, you know, his legacy, too, is to remind people the world likes to think Jack Daniels is this mass-produced, huge, huge thing. Right. And and while it has grown, and the distillery has grown, and the number of barrel houses in Lynchburg have grown, it still all comes from that single source. It's still made the same way. And Angelo would always remind people of the family who started it, the Jack Daniels family, the Motlow family, and uh, the importance of that, their commitment to excellence. Um, and so that kept it small, mm-hmm. him being able to talk to it and had spent time with the Motlows and, and Let Motlow and whatnot. So that's part of his legacy. And to honor that legacy in 2010, um, they, they created the Angelo Lucchese bottle. Now, mind you this, Angelo got a bottle with his name on it. Before Sinatra did. I was going to say, there are very few people who, uh, who have their name that is officially on a, a bottle of Jack Daniels, and, uh, and, and Angelo made it to that finish line before his longtime friend did. He, yes, he did. That's how much the company thought of him. Angelo joked that now it was up to him to sell all of these cases of whiskey with his name <laughs> on it, but, but they went really, really fast. Yeah. Um, because distributors all across the country 
knew who Angelo Lucchese was, and it, it went very quickly. It's a 90-proof whiskey because it was a bottle to celebrate his 90th birthday. Okay. And that's the proof uh, Jack Daniels was when Sinatra was out on the road and when Angelo started. So it was kind of a nod to both Angelo's uh, birth year and and kind of the past of Jack Daniels that's led to such a wonderful future. You talk about a salesman and a celebrity and you go, they were friends and people go, yeah, right. Uh, to give you some idea of the depth of this friendship, uh, you know, Sinatra was aware of, of uh, Frank or of uh, Angelo's religious underpinnings. Mm -hmm. And so they're at this dinner and it's a it's a bunch of, it's just guys it's a bunch of guys and in front of each of their places they've got a bottle of Jack Daniels uh, unopened and that was like a big deal you know to get a bottle at that time period Angelo's sitting with it and they're talking and they are swearing a blue streak <laughs> back and forth back and forth Sinatra kind of catches Angelo's eyes and see Angelo is kind of blushing and he stops the whole party he just stops and says clean up your language. We're embarrassing the kid. And that's that was his nickname for Angelo. Right. The Haps, Hap and the Motlos called him Ange. Uh, Sinatra called him the kid, even though Angelo was just five years younger. Mm -hmm. At Frank Sinatra's funeral, Angelo Lucchese is not only invited, he sits with the family. And he's the reason that we all know that there is a roll of dimes, a pack of camels, and a bottle of Jack Daniels. Right. Because he saw it being put in, in Frank's casket. Uh, how many whiskey sales folks sit with the family <laughs> of a celebrity? Right. Um, but Angelo was one. And, and he, he was never, as I said, a salesman. He was always your friend. Yeah. Well, Nelson, again, thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing this story with us. We look forward to... Uh, uh, again, picking your brain at some other point in time with, uh, the, uh, again, going back into the legend and lore of J Jack Daniels. Thanks for what you do with this brand, and thanks for spending some time with us. No, it's been fun. It always is, especially when I can talk about somebody like Angelo. Thanks for joining us Around the Barrel. Thanks for checking out this episode of Around the Barrel. You can find archived episodes of Around the Barrel on all major podcast platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and more. Plus, on the web at jackdaniels.com slash podcast. And if you like what you hear, please follow, rate, and review while you're at it. Cheers, y'all, and join us next time for more conversations around the barrel. Your friends at Jack Daniels remind you to drink responsibly. Jack Daniels and Old Number 7 are registered trademarks. Copyright 2023, Jack Daniels. Tennessee whiskey, 40% alcohol by volume, 80 proof. Distilled and bottled by Jack Daniel Distillery, Lynchburg, Tennessee. Around the Barrel is intended for listeners 21 years of age and older.